Nobody can tell our stories like we can. And actually, if we have our stories told for us, at the best, we will be misrepresented. And at the worst, we will be silenced completely. I'm Laura Serrant and I'm Head of Nursing at Manchester Metropolitan University. The beginning of my career was kind of strange. Um, I'd always wanted to be a doctor. I actually applied for medicine and was offered a place to do medicine. And then when I went on the open day, I kind of decided that that wasn't for me. And uh, on the train, uh, decided that I still wanted to work in healthcare. So I came home and decided that I wanted to be a nurse. It wasn't really for me about being a specialist or specialised in one kind of care. It was actually about making sure people had an equal chance of health. And I thought the further I went on in medicine, the further away I would get from the people I wanted to help. I, when I did my training, I was the only black nurse and black nursing student in a whole cohort. Um, there were 30 of us um, who did the degree programme at that time. And this was back in 1982. Um, and I don't know if you remember or you can think back that far, but in 1982, nurses had just changed from being SRNs that everybody knew to being RGNs. And here we were as very, these newfangled degree nurses. Either some of my um, colleagues and some of my fellow nurses, the qualified nurses, didn't really understand the programme I was doing. They all thought I'd already done a degree and was now training to be a nurse. So we spent a lot of time explaining that. And there were many of them who thought that they were doing me a favour by explaining why they didn't agree with nurses doing a degree and you know, how that we were basically going to be too posh to wash. Um, and on the other hand, as a, as a black student nurse, the challenge was that often with some of the patients that I went to care for, some of them would refuse me as their nurse because they, they would say things to my face like, um, I don't want that nurse to look after me because her hands aren't clean. Um, or, you know, does she really know what she's doing? Um, and, and sometimes we just point back and refuse to have me help them. I think the worst day I had was, I think I went in the old Nightingale wards where the beds are all in, in a line. I actually went down six patients before somebody would let me help them um, get ready for the morning. That was a bad day. The challenges I face probably now are slightly different as I've progressed through my career. Um, I'm now used to being one of the only or one of the few um, black academics or black heads of nursing or black nursing professors in the country. So I now manage it differently than I did when I was a, you know, a young student nurse and just trying to get it right. There was something about at 18, coming from a family where um, I had a very clear sense of my own identity, a clear sense of um, my, the country my family came from, the language we spoke, um, how the, my culture, what it meant, and the, the position of self and family and education. So that had a very strong background to kind of help me to, to understand what was going on. This was not a shock to me. I suppose some of the conversations and the reactions were shocking, but they weren't a shock in the whole. The second thing which was really important to me, uh, apart from my friends that I had at the time who were very supportive, was actually how the clinicians reacted in that situation. Um, if they reacted in a way that they actually supported me and would, some of them would quite clearly say to that patient or that family, uh, this student nurse is perfectly able, she will be the person to help you or you, you know, we, we actually don't allow you to choose who you have, then that was a good day. On a poor day, they would actually say to me, oh, don't worry about it, Laura, just move on to the next person. Certainly, um, personally, you know, my mother was a great role model around the importance of being sure of yourself, the importance of identity and the importance of family. If I think professionally, I would say the person who's had the biggest impact on me um, is uh, Dame Professor Elizabeth Anion Wu. She was a person who, who guided me and a good role model. But she was also the person who told me that um, when I obviously recounted my experiences that I've shared with you around being a student nurse, she had also had those experiences and just said, never let anyone tell you that you're not good enough to do it. 
and occasionally she gave me the hard word, which is probably what I needed at the time. She was really well um, involved in the development of sickle cell and thalassemia services and, you know, and the Mary Seacole statue appeal, which, is, um, which she kind of spearheaded. And the Mary Seacole is, was a Jamaican nurse and she went out at the same time as Florence Nightingale to um, the Crimean War. But because of the difference between the two women, you know, she, her being a black woman and, you know, the issues around racism and gender at the time, she wasn't able to work within uh, Florence Nightingale's hospital at Scutari, but actually provided um, care for wounded soldiers on the battlefields of the Crimea. And um, we, we campaigned, um, I was one of the ambassadors of the appeal, and we campaigned um, for quite a long time by, with donations from the public, buying one pound badges, such as this, and Elizabeth Anglo spearheaded that. And there is now a statue of Mary Seacole standing in the grounds of St. Thomas's Hospital, looking at Parliament. And um, Mary Seacole is the only, to date, is the only statue of a black woman in London. I think I've made myself laugh quite a few times. Um, and I have three children who always bring me back down to earth. You know, um, and occasionally they even say it sounds like I know what I'm talking about, so I can't be doing too bad. And the fact that even today, people don't have an equal chance of health. So inequity makes me cry. It makes me frustrated. Um, and it's what drives me and makes me turn up for work. I think part of it in terms of inequity and the way in which people sometimes make assumptions about different groups, whether that's on the basis of ethnicity, sexuality, ability or disability, that I think impacts on their life chances and the chances of them having good health, are really linked into kind of not only our social conditioning, but also the way in which we think about people. I think we have a sense of sometimes that we, what we do is we compartmentalise people into this is a black person, this is a gay person, this is a woman, this is somebody who lives in a particular kind of town. And what we fail to do is actually to look at the kind of intersectional bits, the bits where, you know, here I am, for example, you know, I am not, I, I am not at one time a black woman and at one time a woman and at one time somebody who was born in a very poor, poor um, back to back slum terrace you know i am all those things at the same time and i think sometimes what we do is we we develop services uh, that and we try and compartmentalize people and as a result of that we actually end up with situations where because we believe that black women from certain uh, communities make a lot of noise or fuss therefore we cannot we cannot trust ourselves that when they are screaming or shouting or calling out that they are actually in as much pain as somebody who we stereotype to be to be very quiet or silent when they feel things so i think it's about the way we we look at those things i also think that sometimes in research and in teaching and, and training of health professionals we continue not only do we compartmentalize but sometimes we remain completely silent on these issues so, for example, within nursing, sometimes what we do is we focus so much on getting the clinical skill right that we don't necessarily think about the, the person and how we adapt those skills or those, the application of those skills in order to make sure that everybody has an equal chance. Whether or not you get training or development to be able to action that depends on where you're trained. Was the tutor interested? Is it something that was brought up? Because it's not a compulsory part of what we expect from practitioners in the 21st century, which I think is absolutely outrageous. Um, I think that the students who undertake training to be nurses today are probably some of my biggest superheroes. They have to do their degree. They also train at the same time for a three-year full-time professional role. They're doing night shifts, they're doing weekends, they're doing all that as well as studying for a degree. And still, despite all that, they manage to come out with great degrees and they manage to make fantastic nurses. So absolutely, you know, I, I applaud them. Um, 
continuing to walk that balance that I do between working in education and pushing and driving health policy and working internationally. Many of the conditions and issues that we face are not isolated to one island or one country. They're global things. And so I think the, the opportunities for ensuring that people have a better chance of health and life on a global scale is, is probably my next challenge, I would say. Supporting other women within my field comes, I think, not only from my work, um, hopefully as the head of department in the nursing um, department at Manchester Metropolitan, but also from the work that I do um, with the chief nursing officer and on policy nationally and internationally. Um, my work there is to both act as a role model, I mentor people directly and provide coaching for them, but I think also primarily it's about being at the table where those strategic decisions are made and making sure that issues of inclusion are on the agenda. One of the issues, one of the challenges we have with healthcare is that it's based on the evidence that we've got. We've got we use the evidence to determine what works, what doesn't work, how we should do it and when we should do it. One of the problems is that much of that evidence isn't from women, even less of that evidence is from women from, of colour, even less of that evidence is from women who are gay, bisexual, trans or queer, even less of that information is from women with disabilities. So I would say that in order for us all to have an equal or a better chance of health, we need evidence from a whole range, a whole diversity of women, because if we don't investigate and present the evidence about the things that impact on our lives, nobody else will do it. But it's also about recognising the, the, the different contribution, the different value added by having women and other diverse groups within research. And that's not about minimising the impact or the, the, the contributions made by men. I think they're equally important. But I think women in research is about being equal but different. And actually, in doing that, we actually help everybody, men, women, and everybody, to actually have the best evidence and the best information on which to make decisions. <laughs>